Salutations to all our future judges. In this video, we are going to see Indian Evidence Act 1872. But before going into the video, I would like to make few requests to our viewers as well as the subscribers. Kindly do not skip the video. Watch the video from the beginning till the end. If you skip in between, you may be missing very crucial information or very crucial aspects which have been explained. Hence, watch from the beginning till the end. And next request is, please do have a notebook and a pen with you. Because various questions which have been asked in Evidence Act in various exams would be mentioned or would be stated. And in addition to this, idea would be given as to how questions could be framed in a particular section. It is very important for you. So you all need to make a note of all these aspects. And in addition to this, some additional illustrations would also be given while teaching the act. Hence, you please make a note of all those additional illustrations as well. They would be of absolute help to you in understanding the particular section. And in addition to this, various ways or techniques would be taught which would help you to remember those sections or to say some memory techniques would be given. This would be really helpful to you in remembering the sections when you go to the exam. I hope this video would be of absolute and great utility to you. Chapter 10 of the examination of witnesses. This particular chapter is very very important for practicing advocates as well as the judicial exam aspirants since questions have been asked from this particular chapter. Section 135 Order of Production and Examination of Witnesses So, basically in which order a witness is to be examined or produced shall be regulated by law and practice. If no such law or practice is there, then it will be decided by the court. For example, if a party has 10 witnesses, then in which order the witnesses are to be examined shall be determined by the court if there is no specific law and practice in this regard. Now, let us move to section 136. Judge to decide as to admissibility of evidence. Whether an evidence is admissible or not, it will be decided by the judge. So, on what basis the judge will decide this? That is a question. Imagine a party is going to the court and saying to the judge that I have an evidence. By using this evidence, I am trying to prove fact A. Then the court will decide whether fact A is relevant to the case. If the court or if the judge thinks that it is not relevant, then in that case the evidence will not be accepted. If the court thinks or the judge thinks that the evidence what has been produced is relevant, then in that case that particular evidence may be accepted. However, if the fact proposed to be proved is admissible upon proof of some other fact, then the court may ask or the judge may ask the last mentioned fact to be proved before the evidence of first mentioned fact unless the party undertakes to give proof of such fact and the court is satisfied with such undertaking. So, to understand this simply, imagine there is fact A and fact B. If fact A is to be proved, then fact B is to be proved first. Then in that case, the court may ask for fact B to be proved. Then the court may permit to prove fact A. Otherwise, if the party says that I am ready to give an undertaking that I will prove this fact, then if the court is satisfied with that particular undertaking, in that case, the court may permit to prove the first mentioned fact, that is fact A. If the relevancy of one alleged fact depends upon another alleged fact being first proved, then in that case, the court may either or the judge may either permit the first fact to be proved or the second fact to be proved. So, this order may change. If the court or the judge feels that the second fact should be proved first, then the court may direct the person to prove the second fact. Or if the court feels that first fact is to be proved first, then the court may permit the first fact to be proved. Now, 
let us move on to the illustrations illustration a now just imagine that i am trying to prove a particular fact to the court which is relevant and a person has given a statement about that particular fact and that person is dead he is no more and this statement was obtained under section 32 it could be a dying declaration so this person he is dead so he cannot come and depose in the court he cannot say that this statement is given by me obviously it's a known fact so in that case what we can do is we should first prove to the court that the person is dead we need to produce a death certificate to the court proving that the person is no more hence the relevant statement under section 32 is to be taken by the court now let us move to the next example illustration b now i am going to the court and saying to the court that the original document is lost i am producing a copy to prove the contents of the document then in that case i should prove to the court that the original document is lost then if the court is satisfied that the original document is lost i can produce the copy of the said document now let us move to illustration c let us try to understand this particular illustration by way of a diagrammatic representation so that you get a better clarity of what it conveys now imagine there is a house b goes into this house and steals a ring and a chain he gives these properties to a a denies that he is in possession of the property now the court can do this court can say first identify this property identify the set property and go for denial that is this one can be first this one can be second or else this one can be second this one can be first that is the court can say first identify the properties then let us go for denial or the court can say first let us go for denial then let us identify the property it simply says that court can decide the order in which it needs to be done now let us move to illustration d there is a fact a which some person is trying to prove to the court saying that this is the cause or effect of the fact in issue that is this fact is responsible for the fact in issue in that case there are various intermediate facts b c d which must be shown to exist before fact A. So, in that case, the court may either permit A to be proved before B, C or D or may require B, C, D to be proved before permitting proof of A. So, in this example also, we can understand that court has got an absolute discretion to decide the way or the order in which things are to be proved. Now, let us move to section 137 this is a very very important section let us try to understand this particular section 137 by way of a diagrammatic representation so that we get a clarity of what the particular section tries to convey imagine there are two parties a and b a is the plaintiff or the person who is filing the case and B is the defendant. So, in case this A has two witnesses, B has three witnesses. When A is calling these two witnesses and examines them, he is examining them, then in that case, these two witnesses are called as chief examination the examination of these two witnesses are called as chief examination and when this b is 
examining these two witnesses it is called as cross examination and again after this cross examination a is again questioning this person or again examining these two witnesses then it is called as re examination so simply to understand this if i call a person and i examine him then it is called as chief examination my opposite party will examine him that is cross examination section 138 order of examinations generally when a case is being conducted the chief examination comes first then the cross examination then the re examination this is the order in which examination is being done and in addition to this the examination and cross examination must relate to relevant facts so as simple as that when you cross examine a person or when you chief examine a person or when you even re examine a person in all these cases your questions should bring out a fact which is relevant or your question should be quite connected to the relevant facts but the cross examination need not be confined to what witness has testified in the examination chief examination so to put it simply if a person is being cross examined the person who is posing the question or the adverse party who is raising this questions need not stick to what he has stated in the chief examination he can ask questions away from the chief examination as well that is permitted by law now let us move to direction of re examination if there is a re examination the intention of that re examiner re examination should be to explain matters referred to in the cross examination however if you want to introduce a new matter by way of re examination you can still do it but the court should permit you to introduce that particular fact in the re examination and in that case the adverse party may again cross examine that person pertaining to that particular fact which you introduced section 139 cross examination of person called to produce a document if a person is asked to produce a document in that case that particular person does not become a witness and he cannot be cross examined however if that person is called as a witness then in that case that person can be cross examined section 140 witnesses to character witnesses to character may be cross examined and re examined so what this particular section tries to explain is if you want to establish to the court that a person is of a bad character so you bring witnesses to prove this particular fact in that case that particular witness which you are bringing to the court may be cross examined and re examined section 141 this particular section 141 speaks about leading questions so if i suggest the answer to the person in the box in the examination box or in the witness box and i expect to receive the answer from him based on what i have provided him in that case it is called a leading question for example if i ask a witness in the box he was not there correct and if he says yes then it's a leading question or i can ask that particular person you have never seen him there correct and he says yes then that is a leading question these are some examples for the leading questions now let us move to section 142 when they must not be asked that is the leading questions when you cannot ask leading questions generally cannot be asked in chief examination and re examination if it is objected by the adverse party then you can get the permission of the court and ask those questions otherwise these questions cannot be asked in chief examination or the re examination the court shall permit leading questions with respect to certain matters for example if it is kind of introductory or things which are undisputed so both the parties accept a particular thing in that case leading question can be asked or in the opinion of the court has been sufficiently proved in all these cases leading questions can be raised section 143 leading questions can be asked in cross examination 
I hope you would have liked the video. If you like the video, please do press the thumbs up button and do share the video with your friends and motivate them. If you are not subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe the channel and share the channel with your friends. If you feel that I have left something in this video or you want me to change the way in explanations are given for the sections, please do let me know by way of comments. Let us join hands together and contribute for a learner society. Thank you.